Good morning. So this morning we're going to be continuing in our series that's based on our theme for this year, being the household of God. What does it mean for us to truly be the church? And so last week we kind of began looking at some sustaining aspects of the church when we looked at what Luke has to tell us in Acts chapter 2 and verses 42 through 47 that one of the identifying and sustaining activities of the church is our reliance on the word of God. But this is much more than just knowing God's word, but it's allowing that word to transform our lives. But not only does Luke tell us in Acts chapter 2 that the church is sustained by its reliance on the word of God, but he also tells us that the first century church was sustained by the fellowship. Our relationships and interactions with one another sustain us. The church, this church, is successful. We are able to thrive in large part because of the way that we relate to one another. However, before we can talk about how we are to fellowship, I think we first must talk about how we are to love one another. Because if we don't truly love one another, then I don't think we're going to be able to fellowship with one another. Because I believe that the foundation of Christian fellowship And what separates Christian fellowship from all other kinds of fellowship is the mutual love that we have for one another. I mean, what reason would we have for coming together if we don't love each other? Why would we want to spend so much time around people who can be so completely different from us if we don't love them? Why would we want to give up of ourselves and give up of our needs to help other Christians if we don't have love for them? Love must be the foundation of Christian fellowship. So how are we to love? What does Christian love look like? And I want to draw your attention first this morning to what Jesus says about love in John chapter 13 in verses 34 and 35. He says, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. There it is. There's the call. There's the call of Jesus for his people, for his church, to have love for one another. But I want you to particularly notice that Jesus says it is because of this love that people will know we are his disciples. You know, sometimes we get so caught up in the things that we believe separate us that make the church of Christ different from other Christian groups. We make our primary focus the things that we believe make us different. We're different because of the way that we worship. Or we're different because of the way that we're organized. Or we're different because we take the Lord's Supper every Sunday and so on and so forth. And it's obviously not that any of these things are wrong or bad or we shouldn't be doing them, but it's not these things that the Bible says ought to set us apart. Jesus doesn't say people will know we are his disciples because of how we worship. Jesus doesn't say that people will know we are his disciples because of the way we're organized. Jesus doesn't say that people will know we are his disciples because of how often we take the Lord's Supper, even though as his disciples, Scripture calls us to do these things. I want to make sure you don't mishear me this morning. As disciples and followers of Jesus, Scripture calls us to do these things, but the Bible and Jesus never say that it's these things that ought to set us apart. But what Jesus does say is that people ought to know that we are his disciples because of the way that we love. Jesus says that people should be able to look at the way that his followers love one another and know that we are his disciples. Wouldn't it be great if we could honestly say that we are different not just because of the way that we worship or not just because of the way that we're organized or not just because of how often we take the Lord's Supper, but what if we could honestly say that we are different because of the way 
that we love. Wouldn't it be great if we could say that what sets the church of Christ apart from all other Christian groups is the self-sacrificial, godly love that we have for one another? And wouldn't it be great if people could look at us from the outside and think the same thing? And Jesus says that we show this identifying love by loving one another just as he has loved us. Our love is to be characteristic of love. And so I want to spend the bulk of our time this morning looking at a story that I believe truly shows us what the love of Jesus looks like, and so by extension, what our love is to look like. And so if you have your Bibles with you. I really want to encourage you this morning to turn over with me to John chapter 4. And even if you're someone who doesn't normally turn and follow along during the sermon, I really want to encourage you to do so this morning because we're going to be reading a large sum of Scripture here in just a moment. And here in John chapter 4, we have the story of Jesus and the Samaritan woman at the well. A story that many of us are probably, to some extent, familiar with. So here in just a moment, we're going to read through this story together. And we're going to talk about how we see the love of Jesus for this woman. But before we do so, I want to begin by telling you how I'm going to talk about the love of Jesus today. Because it's probably going to be a little bit different than you've heard before. Rather than talking about what Jesus' love is, I'm going to talk about what Jesus' love is not. Because I believe that the majority of us in this room know what love is. Most of us have heard more sermons than we can count on what love is, what love is supposed to look like, and how we're supposed to love, and yet many of us do things and treat people in a way that we believe is loving, when in reality is not love. And so I want to focus this morning not so much on what love is as the ways in which we are called not to love. So follow along with me. John chapter 4, verse 1. John writes, Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus was making and baptizing more disciples than John, although Jesus himself did not baptize but only his disciples, He left Judea and departed again for Galilee. And he had to pass through Samaria. So he came to a town of Samaria called Sychar, near the field that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. So Jesus, wearied as he was from his journey, was sitting beside the well. It was about the sixth hour. A woman from Samaria came to him to draw water. Came to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me a drink. For his disciples had gone away into the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, ask for a drink from me, a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have nothing to draw water with, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our father Jacob? He gave us this well, and drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks of the water that I will give him will never be thirsty again. The water that I will give him will become in him a spring of water welling up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will not be thirsty or have to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come here. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. 
The woman said to him, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. You know, I I always find this response by the woman kind of funny every time I read it. She comes across Jesus, who she's never met before in her life, and he recounts her entire history, and her response is, Sir, I perceive you to be a prophet. Well, no, duh. I mean, if, if, if I came across someone I've never met before, and they tell me my entire life story... I think I would perceive that they were a prophet as well. Anyways, picking back up, verse 19. She she responds, Sir, I perceive that you are a prophet. Our fathers worshipped on this mountain. But you say that in Jerusalem is the place where people ought to worship. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me. The hour is coming when neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem will you worship the Father. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming and is now here, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. For the Father is seeking Him. God is spirit. And those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to Him, I know that Messiah is coming, He who is called Christ. When He comes, He will tell us all things. Jesus said to her, I who speak to you am he. Just then his disciples came back. They marveled that he was talking with a woman, but no one said, what do you seek? Or why are you talking with her? So the woman left her water jar and went away into town and said to the people, come, see a man who told me all that I ever did. Can this be the Christ? They went out of the town and were coming to him. Now skip down with me to the end of the story. Verse 39. Many Samaritans from that town believed in him because of this woman's testimony. He told me all that I ever did. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there, three, uh, he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, It is no longer because of what you said that we believe, For we have heard for ourselves and we know that this is indeed the Savior of the world. I believe that there are eight principles about what love is not we can glean from the way in which Jesus shows love to this Samaritan woman. And the first thing that I believe we can learn from this story is that love does not make uninformed judgments. And I, I want to be honest with you from the get-go. And that is that it's not always or necessarily wrong for us to judge. The passages that people go to to say that it's wrong to judge are always taken out of context. And we don't have the time this morning to go to each and every one of those and look at them individually. But I just want to say it's not always, it's not necessarily wrong for us to judge. Scripture does call us to go... And, well, for that matter, I believe that we should want our fellow Christians to go to a person that we see in sin in order to try and help them. Uh, Logan talked a little bit about this a couple of Wednesday nights back. And several Sunday evenings back, I did a lesson that I called the Sanctity of the Church Community, where I gave us some principles that I believe we should follow when we go to our sinning brother or sister. And so I I would encourage you, if you have some time today or later on in the week, to go back and to listen or to watch those lessons, because I think they'll be really beneficial to you and uh, a good supplement to what we're going to be talking about this morning. But I just want to say from the beginning that it's not always, it's not necessarily wrong for us to judge. We, We are called to go to our brother and sister when we see them in sin in order to try and help them. However, we should not judge if we are not fully informed about that other person's situation. The backstory of this Samaritan woman is kind of interesting. Jesus says that she has been married five times. She's had five previous husbands, and the man that she is now with is not her husband. And when most of us hear this, when most of us hear Jesus recount this woman's story, we immediately jump over into our judgment zone. One of the first questions that we ask when we hear this is, well, what has she done wrong? 
What has this woman done in the past to ruin these first five relationships? And one of our first thoughts is maybe, well, she must have cheated on them and they divorced her, and at least now she's living in a sinful relationship with the sixth man. She's doing something with them that she should not be doing. However, the story doesn't say that. Not a single one of those conclusions can be found in the text here in John chapter 4. For all we know, this woman's first five husbands could have all died. And if you were the sixth man, would you marry her? I don't know about you, but if I was talking with a girl whose first five husbands had mysteriously died, I'm not going to marry her. I'll be her friend, but I'm not going to turn out to be that sixth husband that dies. And the next time she comes to Jesus, she says, well, you've been married six times now. And the seventh man that you're with, I'm not going to go there. But the point that I want us to notice is that Jesus does not pass judgment on this woman. And yet he knows the entire story. Jesus knows whether or not her first five husbands died or she cheated on them, but yet he does not use any of this to judge her, but instead offers her living water. Sometimes when we hear something about somebody, when when someone tells us about what somebody else is doing, what they have, have done, we can be real quick to judge them just like we are with this woman before we have gained all the facts, before we know what really happened. We can be very quick to jump to a negative conclusion and then go and try to confront that person or even worse, start stirring up gossip and talking to all kinds of people about what it is that we've heard, but this is not love. Jesus knew the entire story but doesn't use that to judge this woman, but instead loves her and seeks to provide for her. Love does not make uninformed judgments and so if you have no way of knowing the whole story if you have no way of knowing if the first five husbands died or if she cheated on all of them then you have no right to judge but should rather be showing the love of Christ by trying to provide and help that other person if you haven't taken the time to honestly think about listen to and pray over both sides of an issue, there should be no words of judgment coming from your mouth, but only words of help. Only words that uplift. Rather than criticizing, what if we showed the love of Jesus by offering living water? Secondly, I think we see that love does not care what other people think. It's interesting to note that this woman comes to the well in the middle of the day around noon. And it would have been customary for women, however, to come and draw their water early in the morning before it got hot, but that's not what this woman does. She comes in the middle of the day, most likely because she's an outcast in her town. People don't like her. Nobody wants to have anything to do with her. So rather than having to deal with the other women in the town, rather than having to face that backlash, this woman comes in the middle of the day when she knows that nobody will be there. Even Jesus' disciples don't like her. When they come back from getting food and see Jesus talking with her, they can't understand what Jesus is doing. First off, because it would have been inappropriate for a man, especially a man like Jesus, who was a rabbi, a teacher, to be, associated, to be associating with a woman, especially a woman with the apparent past that she has as an outcast in her town, it would have been inappropriate for Jesus to do this in the way that he is. Not only that, but the Jews hate the Samaritans. And yet Jesus gives privilege in this story not only to a woman, but to a Samaritan woman. There's a lot of social baggage that comes along with the interaction Jesus has with this woman, but Jesus doesn't care about any of this. Jesus does not allow the thoughts and opinions of the townspeople or of his disciples deter him from loving this woman and providing her with living water. And the same must be true for us. If we are to show the love 
of Jesus, we must get over our fears and our worries of what other people think and how other people might react. Jesus doesn't get caught up in all of this other stuff. He simply loves this woman despite what other people might think. But yet sometimes we are afraid to do the right thing. We don't want to help or support one of our brothers or sisters when they're in need because we're afraid of what other people might think and how other people might respond. But again, this is not love. Love does not care what other people think. Love simply loves despite what other people might think about that love or how other people might react to that love. Because love does not care what other people think. Third, love does not care about statistics. Statistically speaking, this woman probably, or rather this woman's first five husbands probably didn't all die. If we were going to speak about statistics, then chances are she has done at least one thing wrong that ruined one of these past relationships. Statistically, she is probably in an inappropriate relationship with this sixth man, even though we don't get any of this explicitly from the story, as I mentioned earlier. Statistically, because of this woman's questionable history, she is probably going to return back to that questionable past after this encounter with Jesus. But Jesus doesn't allow any of those statistical probabilities to get in his way of showing this woman love. Sometimes we can look at somebody and make a negative judgment about them on the basis of statistics. We say, well, statistically, that person probably thinks like this. Or chances are that person is probably living this kind of sinful lifestyle. Or statistically, because of this person's past, they're probably never going to be able to completely turn their life around. But love does not care about statistics. The love of Jesus doesn't say, well, because this person probably thinks like this or lives like that, or because this person is probably never going to be able to turn their life around, then I don't have to love them. That's not what love does. Again, love loves despite what statistics might say about that love. Fourth, love does not discriminate. As I mentioned earlier, the Jews hated the the Samaritans. And the reason for this was that a Samaritan was half Jew and half Gentile, and so the Jews viewed them as unclean half-breeds. And so most Jews would take the long way and go around Samaria when they were traveling up from Judea to Galilee, this route that Jesus took, rather than going right through Samaria, the shorter and easier way. But Jesus chooses to take that route. Jesus chooses to go right through Samaria because his love does not discriminate. Jesus doesn't care about this woman's race. Jesus doesn't care that the other Jews, that his fellow Jews, consider this woman to be an unclean half-breed. Jesus doesn't care about any of this. All Jesus sees is a woman that is broken and in need of his living water and so loves her by providing for her deepest needs. And if we will be honest with ourselves, if we will honestly examine our lives, our actions, our thoughts, we will all find that there are times in our lives where we too can make negative judgments about people on the basis of race or on the basis of a person's place of origin. However, love does not discriminate. The love of Jesus doesn't care what race you are. The love of Jesus doesn't care where you were born. The love of Jesus, rather, transcends all walls and barriers that humans try to put up because his love does not discriminate. If we are going to show the love of Jesus, it cannot be a discriminatory love. Fifth, love is not limited by sin. Again, as we've talked about, we don't know explicitly from this story what happened with those first five husbands or 
the kind of relationship that this woman is in with this current man. But I think we can probably, at minimum, rightly assume that she's in an inappropriate relationship with the sixth man. And we may be able to assume that she's done at least one thing wrong with these previous men. But Jesus does not allow the sin that's present in this woman's life keep him from showing her love. Yes, Jesus does call her to live by his standards, by partaking of his living water. But Jesus only offers her that living water in the first place because his love for her is not limited by her sins. Just because someone has done something wrong, just because a person has messed up, just because someone has sinned is not an excuse not to love them, care for them, and provide for them. But yet we want to use it as an excuse. Yes, I, I think we are called to call that person to a better life if they're still living in sin, but we can't use the sin that's existing in their life as an excuse not to love and care for them. Jesus loves and provides living water to this woman despite the sins that are present in her life, and the same must be true for us. Even if it's that person's sin that has caused the mess that they are in, that they need our help with, as is probably the case with this woman, that's not an excuse not to love, care, and provide for them. Because the love of Jesus is not limited by sin. Six, the love of Jesus is not limited by beliefs. As a Samaritan, this woman believes that the correct place to worship God is on top of Mount Gerizim. Whereas Jesus, being a Jew, knows that the right place to worship is down in Jerusalem. So Jesus and this woman have very different understandings of worship, very different understandings about God, but Jesus does not allow the differences in beliefs that exist between him and this woman keep him from showing her love. Sometimes we can fail to love people as we should because of different beliefs that we have as compared to them. Because uh, this person goes to this church or they go to that church and they're not a member of the, the church of Christ, sometimes we think it's okay not to love them like we should or at least view them as lesser than we are to look down on them. But I want to say from, at, from the beginning that we all have to understand that we are in as just as much need of the grace of God as anyone, and so we have no right to look down or think less of anybody else. But the love of Jesus in this story is not limited by different religious beliefs, but despite those differences, Jesus shows this woman love and provides her with the living water that only he can give. Seventh, love is not fake. Jesus doesn't have to fake or pretend to love this woman, but he genuinely loves and cares for her. And sometimes we, because of some of these other circumstances that can be surrounding a person that we've already talked about up to this point, can just try to pretend to love them. We try to fake it till we make it. But the love of Jesus does not fake it till it makes it, which is just a fancy way of saying that we tolerate someone instead of actually loving them. Not to mention the fact that fake love can be spotted from a mile away. And so most of us would probably agree that we would rather someone show us no love than to fake love. If we're going to show the love of Christ, it must be a true and genuine love for that other person. And lastly, number eight, love does not leave people in need. This Samaritan woman Jesus chooses to interact with is in need in two predominant ways. First, because she's an outcast in her town, she has social needs. But also she, just like all of us, has spiritual needs. She's in need of the living water that only Jesus can provide. And so Jesus does not leave her in need. Jesus doesn't let the thoughts and opinions of the townspeople or of his disciples, 
He doesn't uh, allow differences in beliefs. He doesn't allow sin that's present in this woman's life. He doesn't allow statistics or race to get in the way of him caring and providing for the needs of this woman. None of those other things mattered. Jesus sees her in need and immediately responds by first making her the hero of her town by bringing everyone to the Messiah, dealing with her social needs and then telling her how to obtain living water, dealing with her spiritual needs. You know, sometimes we can get so caught up in other things. We can get so caught up in circumstances that are surrounding a person. We can get so caught up in other people's opinions, how other people might react. We can get so caught up in statistics or race. We can get caught up in sin that exists in someone's life. We can get caught up in differences in beliefs that exist between us and another person and use these things as excuses not to provide for their needs. But the love of Jesus was and still is a kind of love that seeks to reach out and provide for the needs of all people regardless of those other circumstances. And so if we are to show the love of Jesus, we must help those who are in need. Not we should help those in need, or we can help those in need, but we must help those in need. We don't have a choice in the matter. Biblical love requires us to help people who are in need. Being a Christian requires us to help people in need despite outside circumstances. But in this country, we have historically created this mindset that people just need to pick themselves up by their own bootstraps. However, the fact of reality is not everybody has boots. Some people need to be given the bootstraps to pick themselves up by. And so as loving Christians, we cannot sit by and leave somebody in need and hope they're going to be able to just pull their life together on their own because the fact is not everybody will. Not everybody will. The love of Jesus does not leave people in need, but it reaches out and seeks to provide for the needs of everyone. And so as we come to a close here this morning, I just kind of want to have a little bit of a heart-to-heart -heart with you. Not as preacher to congregation, but as concerned Christian to other concerned Christians. Because we have all got to be better at this. Each and every one of us in this room can be better at showing the love of Christ. And so if up to this point you've been thinking about everybody else that needs to better show love, it's time to turn that magnifying glass back on yourself. Because if you don't think you have very much room to improve your love, or maybe you even think that you have no room to improve your love, it's probably because you're lacking love the most. Because we can all better improve our love. And so my challenge for us here in this room this morning is to think about specific ways that we can better show the love of Christ. And I want to challenge us to think about specific situations and specific people whom we failed to show the love of Christ to. And seek not only to make that right, but to be better starting today. Because the way that we show the world that we are followers of Christ is not through the way that we worship. It's not through how often we take the Lord's Supper, how we're organized. But we show the world that we are followers of Christ through the way that we love. And I can promise you this. Those of us here in this room today would make an effort to better show the love of Christ. The church here at White House would grow and thrive more than you ever thought possible because love 
is that important. And it all begins right here. It begins in this room. Because if we can't show the love of Christ to those who are in this room, how are we supposed to show the love of Christ to the world? If we can't even help our own people who are in need, how are we supposed to help the world? It begins at home. Demonstrating the love of Christ begins by loving and caring and providing for the needs of those who are in this room, those people who are sitting right next to you, by treating them in the way of Christ despite the outside circumstances, despite what other people might think or how they might react, regardless of statistics or race or sin that may be present or differences in beliefs that you may have with them, the demonstrating the love of Christ starts right here overcoming those other circumstances and unconditionally loving and providing for those who are sitting right next to us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we come to you this morning and we we recognize the, the high calling you have on us as your people to show the kind of love that you've shown us to each other. And Lord, we we know that we fail. We probably fail more often at showing that kind of love than we succeed at it. And so for that, we, we repent. We ask for forgiveness when we fail to show that love. And Lord, we, we ask this morning that you would allow your spirit to fill this place, to, to fill this space, to empower us, to encourage us, to show the kind of love that you have shown to us, to each other. In those times that are hard, in those times that are difficult, in those times that our natural reaction is to do the complete opposite, that we would look to you and remember that despite our rebellion against you, you have loved us and extend that love to others. Lord, we're we're just, we, we can't, there's not enough words to describe what you've done for us. And our prayer is is that the kind of love that we show as a church will be a kind of love that cannot be described as well because it will be a kind of love empowered first by your love. Lord, we're thankful for your son. The ultimate uh, demonstration of your love for us. In his name we pray. Amen. Reach out and give